Welcome, Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. This is the Fins Pod. My name is Moose, your host, and the Dolphins rookies and vets report to training camp this Tuesday. We're finally here, baby. Arguably the longest offseason of my life is over, and we can get rolling with some actual football rather than all this speculation. But we do have a little more speculating to do because the team made a bevy of roster moves leading into the weekend. We're going to touch on those as well as on some other general news and notes surrounding the team. Without further ado, let's dive in. Yeah, Mina, did you just see that stat we just had up there that they rank like like 31st in the NFL when it comes to wide receivers getting separation? That, that That says it all. I mean, and this was a team that was injury plagued at the wide receiver position and the running back spot. They did, uh, you know, have more additions this offseason that should help. But but one other point that we need to make here is that I've talked to people down here uh, with the organization who talk about the win differential, the point differential of this past season and how this is a team that really, I, I feel like I sound like Mina when I talk about win differential here. Like, I don't even know what it means exactly. But, but they, do, they do tell me that this is a team – that didn't lose a lot of games by very much. And as a result, they feel like that margin of defeat will actually translate to more wins this year because of their additions. This is a team that is very bullish about their expectations, and I get the sense that they think that they're going to sneak up on some people this year if they can close some of those games out and maybe uh, maybe not lose them by such a close margin. We're excited to announce our first sponsor. From the hills of Humboldt County, California, our friends at Canadip CBD, the nation's leading tobacco and nicotine-free dip alternative, are excited to present the game of the year. Canadip CBD is a fast-acting and innovative way to consume CBD that works and tastes great, and it won't make you play sneak at you with the wife during football season. So here's what the game of the year is. Head over to CanadipCBD.com and click on the game of the year tab, or visit Canadip's main Instagram and look for the blue check mark. All you have to do to enter is provide your email, and then one winner will be chosen on August 31st. This is actually a sweet deal. You pick any regular season NFL game of your choosing, and you get a plus one with airfare for two included with luxury hotel lodging, great seats for the game, plus a little extra cash for food and drinks just to enjoy your trip. That's right. Canadips is randomly choosing one lucky winner for the fan experience of a lifetime. So head over to CanadipCBD.com to enter, or go to the official Canadips Instagram account and make sure you type it all the way out to find the blue check mark. Be the winner and check out the Dolphins in Vegas or travel to Tampa to see Tua take on Brady and the defending Super Bowl champs or whatever game you want. Thank you to Canadips again for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the Dolphins. We're going to start with probably the least sexy move the Dolphins made, but it is extremely important to the long-term future. The Dolphins restructured newly added and potential X-Factor Bernardrick McKinney's contract, and check out the previous episode in case you missed why he's an X-Factor, but although we don't know exactly how the contract was restructured, we can make some educated assumptions. Remember, Miami acquired McKinney from the Texans after shipping away linebacker slash defensive end Shaq Lawson. Lawson did not nearly provide the spark nor pressure that we were looking for, and with the addition of now-rookie Jalen Phillips, he's not needed. Instead, a run-stopping linebacker who can help fill the void left from Kyle Van Noy was what the doctor ordered. And some would argue that McKinney is a better all-around linebacker than even Jerome Baker. I wouldn't. Maybe a couple seasons ago, yes. But McKinney is coming off of a shoulder injury and does not possess the same explosive burst that Baker does. Although McKinney is still young at just 28, Miami could cultivate a role for him in this defense to maximize his skill set. And I truly believe he will likely play strong side, the role that was held by Van Noy last season. Although, to be completely honest, going back and looking at Tate from 2020, you realize Miami's amoeba defense allowed far more position flexibility than most NFL defenses. McKinney is able to line up at the mic, stand up right next to the defensive tackle showing pressure on the line, or he can play just strong side linebacker and help seal the edge, allowing for his teammates to clean up any run plays. And I'm definitely excited about McKinney, and the team clearly is too, because when you restructure a contract, it means you're likely moving money around to free up space in the now. And that means kicking the can down the road a little bit and spreading that player's money money out. And unless you want dead cap, 
ideally that player who's being restructured, he's going to be staying on the team. So that money's actually being invested in the long run. And you're not just kicking it down the road like regimes of the past and then having to deal with it years later. Look, Miami's going to end up paying him the same amount, just with a reduced yearly cap hit. And Miami has control over McKinney through the 2023 season. Although we don't have the exact details of the restructure, as I mentioned, we do know that he's making $7 million in base salary this year, and it's likely that the team is converting a large portion of that into a signing bonus. And by doing that, it would lower his cap number this year, potentially freeing up to $4 million. And instead, Miami's going to have to spread that amount, the $4 million signing bonus, over the remainder of his contract, or whatever the amount of the signing bonus is. So you see how this benefits Miami, but it also benefits McKinney. Like we said, the amount that he's getting paid at the end of his contract, it's going to be the same. But now Miami has a longer-term obligation to him financially, meaning that his job security is likely going up. Now, we do know that Chris Greer and Brian Flores do not mind moving on from a mistake, even if it does mean adding to the dead cap and swallowing some money. So he shouldn't feel too, too comfortable. He still needs to perform. But I have a feeling Flo knows exactly what to do with him. And in the short term, Miami's freed up some money to either add other free agents or potentially bump up the money for a disgruntled superstar. We shall see. Next up, more contract news. The team finally signed second-round pick defensive back Javon Holland to his rookie deal. It's good to get it done right before camp. Unfortunately, there are still two rookies who remain unsigned, including Notre Dame's Liam Eichenberg, right tackle, and Boston College's Hunter Long, tight end. But that should get done within this week, if I had to guess. Javon himself signed a four-year deal worth $8.7 million with $3.7 million in a signing bonus. That's a hell of a signing bonus. Holland is expected to be a key contributor to this defense early. Look, remember, Flores has the closest connection to the secondary as a coach, and that's where he spent a lot of his time when in New England under Bill Belichick, who also specializes in defensive back development. Flo has no issue throwing a young kid out there if he's ready and can process the defense. Look, Brandon Jones, who was taken a later round than Holland last year, saw plenty of action as a rookie and, frankly, really impressed. The hype around Holland is similar to Brandon Jones in that they are both known to be cerebral defensive backs who can help align the defense and be around the ball due to their high football IQs. Unlike Jones, though, Holland possesses more natural athleticism and raw speed, which gives him a leg up for taking the free safety position long term. However, Jones' experience is definitely going to aid him as well now that he's entering year two. Don't get me wrong, we're going to see them playing together plenty considering this defense floods the fields with corners and safeties, but someone needs to be the starter, and it's good that the contract issue is now resolved and Javon can focus on doing what he does best, football. Moving on to the bigger news of the weekend, Miami brought in some defensive depth with the signing of linebacker and former Seahawk Shaquem Griffin, as well as corner Cravon LeBlanc. And we're going to start with Griffin. He's a near household name due to his incredible story. Due to an issue at birth, Shaquem was born without a left hand, and despite that physical hurdle, he was able to make it to the NFL. In fact, his brother, his twin brother, Shaquille Griffin, has also made it to the NFL. He plays in the secondary for the Seahawks, while Shaquem is a linebacker. Now, the details of the deal have not been released, but it is a one-year contract. As a player, Shaquem is explosive. He's an amazing combination of speed, power, and raw athleticism. Coming out of the University of Central Florida, many did not know how he would translate to the league. He's been underestimated every step of the way, but he quelled a lot of those concerns, and he's proven to be a valuable rotational piece at the pro level. He's extremely young at just 26 years old, so there's still room for development, but I don't believe he's going to be able to really beat out Jerome Baker or Andrew Van Ginkle or the aforementioned Bernardrick McKinney, but he definitely is going to be in that next tier. He'll be competing with the likes of Sam McGuavin, the former CFL standout who's now entering his third year under Brian Flores in Miami, Kylan Johnson, Duke Riley, who was recently signed this offseason, as well as Brendan Scarlett. Calvin Munson, and then, of course, Alandon Roberts. Where he can make his bones and really secure a spot on the roster is through special teams. He played plenty and at a good level for the Hawks. Realistically, I would expect him and Duke Riley to be duking it out to be Jerome Baker's immediate backup. And if he does play on defense, it's likely going to be as that weak side linebacker where he can use that speed to track down plays and cover running backs and tight ends, something that he has the capability to do. I personally, I'm excited to have Shaquem, not only as a player, because he does have potential to be impactful for sure, and again, the development is there long term, but also for the man that we got. I couldn't imagine 
going through what he went through, especially with a twin brother right beside you the whole time with full function in his hands. It just goes to show you the type of man Shaquem is, as well as his strong background. You can never have too many great character men in your locker room, and perhaps the top baseline requirement for a Miami Dolphin under Brian Flores is you have to love the game of football with everything you have, and Shaquem has proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm rooting for the kid. The other player Miami signed on Friday was cornerback Cravon LeBlanc. And LeBlanc has been in the league since 2016 when he entered as an undrafted free agent out of Florida Atlantic. He bounced around a bit, starting with New England, classic, before joining the Bears where he made a name for himself as a pretty solid slot corner. He then went to Detroit for a bit and has most recently spent his time with the Philadelphia Eagles starting back in 2018. And talking to some people close to the Eagles, they've told me that we got a pretty decent one. Obviously, not some shutdown corner, but his real drawback has not been his skill set. It's his health. When he is on the field, he's an athletic and physical slot corner who can match up with most any guy in the nickel. His main competition is going to be with Javaris Davis, Jamal Perry, and Nick Needham for likely two openings at that nickel spot. Assuming Needham has one spot locked up due to his experience, it's safe to say LeBlanc has a fighter's chance of making this competitive DB room if he can beat out those young guys. He is on par with Needham in terms of ability and overall skill set, and his experience in the league is likely going to pay dividends for him, although he does not have as much experience in this Brian Flores scheme. Although he did enter, enter the league for New England, it's been a long time since he's played in this system. With camp right around the corner, too, you can be sure that we're going to be keeping an eye out on the competition happening in the secondary. I wouldn't read into this signing too much, especially being related to Xavier Howard in any way. If anything, I think McKinney's restructuring is more indicative of a move to keep Howard than signing LeBlanc, meaning that we may get rid of him. But then again, this is the NFL and anything can happen. Make sure to stick with us not to miss a second of it. Unbelievably, the Dolphins haven't finished top 10 in the league in total offense since 1995. That is by far the longest active drought in the NFL. It was also the last year Miami had a Pro Bowl quarterback. His name was Dan Marino. Tamina, what are we thinking about Tua heading into year two? Well, you know, Dan, there are a number of reasons why Tua had an up-and-down rookie season coming off of, obviously, a very short and complicated offseason, made life difficult, the pass protection wasn't always there. To me, the probably number one reason for his struggle was the transition from what I like to call Alabama Open, where college wide receivers are just wide open, to NFL Open. Tua ranked fifth in the league last year in tight window throws, which NFL Next Gen Stats defines as having less than one yard of separation. And that's not entirely on the wide receivers. Some of that is on Tua himself. Some of it is on the scheme. But undeniably, those wide receivers uh, were not able to separate as much as Tua needed. So what did Miami do to address that issue? Well, they went out and added Will Fuller in free agency, one of the most underrated uh, deep threats in the league when he's healthy. And then they drafted Jalen Waddell, perhaps the most explosive wide receiver in the draft. They are hoping for a Jay-Z Kanye style reunion between these two. And if they can get more explosive plays out of Tua, more aggression, then I think that they count this season as successful because the rookie quarterback will have established that he is the franchise quarterback they've been looking for. That's going to do it for us here today. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Fins Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you always to Timothy Ritchie, member of the pod and supporter of the show on Patreon. Check that out. Links in the description or head over to patreon.com slash Fins Pod. Thank you all so much for the continued support. And please remember to like the video if you enjoyed the show, as well as subscribe just so you never miss a chance to chat about your Miami Dolphins. Remember that the show is available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, and of course, here on YouTube. Continue the conversation with us over on Twitter and Instagram at FinsPod. I hope you all have an amazing day. And until next time, stay safe. Love y'all.